So before we start today's lecture, let me just provide a very brief introduction to the course for which this lecture has been organized. This lecture is a part of an advanced certificate program on research in political economy, which is organized by the Ideas Network. We have with us 33 young researchers from across the world who have been participating in this program for the past six months. During this period, we have conducted a number of lecture series and modules on various courses and topics to train our students for research in political economy. In addition to the regular lectures, we have some special lectures that are open to public participation. And today is one such occasion. We have with us today, Dr. Ahilan Kadir Gamar. Dr. Ahilan is a senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Jaffna in Sri Lanka. And he is an editorial board member of the Sri Lanka Journal of Social Sciences. Dr. Ahilan's research interests include agrarian change, cooperatives, and economic alternatives. And he has extensively written on the political economy of Sri Lanka in various forums such as the Hindu and the Polit Economic and Political Weekly. Thank you very much, Dr. Ailan, for delivering today's lecture. Dr. Ailan will be speaking on the topic of Sri Lanka's economic crisis and the unraveling global order for the next 75 to 80 minutes, followed by a discussion and a question and answer session. So without any further delay, I now invite Dr. Ailan to take the floor. Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Ailan. Uh, thank you, uh, Ankur, and uh, many thanks to the uh, Ideas uh, Network uh, for inviting me uh, to give this uh, lecture. Um, I'm really honored and, and really happy to see this um, advanced uh, certificate program on uh, research on political economy being initiated by the uh, Ideas Network. Uh, I hope uh, with the next batch, more uh, Sri Lankan students can also uh, engage with it and maybe we can even find a way to uh, have uh, uh, in-person sessions in Sri Lanka as well, because I think this is um, very much uh, needed. Um, so today's uh, lecture is, um, I see it as a two-part lecture because um, today uh, the title of my lecture is Sri Lanka's economic crisis and the unraveling uh, global order. So I'm going to speak a bit more generally in terms of how this very uh, deep and devastating crisis in Sri Lanka has uh, come about. And uh, the second lecture uh, will be the day after tomorrow on uh, March 1st, where I will be speaking more specifically about uh, that restructuring uh, austerity and the IMF in Sri Lanka. So um, since I'm gonna be speaking on those topics on uh, Wednesday, uh, including about the IMF at length, um, I may not get as much into it in this lecture and I will um, maybe keep uh, a lot of my uh, comments uh, about the IMF and international financial institutions much more uh, to the second uh, lecture. Um, so my uh, perspective is, is more broadly uh, a political economy uh, perspective, um, looking at both uh, the history, the, the structures, uh, and the dynamics that have led uh, to perhaps the worst uh, economic crisis in uh, Sri Lanka's uh, uh, post-colonial history, you know, very much so in the last 100 years since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And I characterize this crisis as one of a uh, depression, right? Um, and I'm, I'm gonna start from there, you know, what I mean uh, by an economic uh, depression, the kind of the, the current uh, global context within which um, this depression has come about in Sri Lanka, and uh, then go back and look at the sort of historical evolution of it uh, coming back again uh, to the uh, present day and with some thoughts on the current situation and uh, what we can expect going forward. Um, 
what I mean by an economic uh, depression is that Sri Lanka's uh, economy in 2022 last year contracted by a tenth. Um, the data is yet to uh, come out and uh, as we all know, GDP uh, growth data, or in this case, contraction, um, initial data will come out and it's likely to be uh, revised in the next couple of years. But uh, many would agree that, you know, it, it's on the order of minus 10%, right? The growth is minus 10%. So that is devastating for the reason that a country like um, Sri Lanka, you would the, the expectation is for it to at least go by 5%. Um, we would like to think in terms of eight or 10% growth, but this is minus 10%. So from the expectations, it's almost 15% or 20% less because there is a, a population growth, um, there is uh, new needs for a, a growing society. And when you think of it in those terms, you can almost think of it as if our economy has contracted by a fifth. That's the lived reality of people. And so it's devastating, right? In, in, in the rural uh, areas, we are hearing of um, people who are only eating one meal a day. Um, children are finding it hard to go to school or they're going to school and fainting because they haven't had uh, uh, in our food. So, so it is that kind of a, a grueling crisis uh, for a country that has been proud of its very high human development uh, indicators. Um, and it's, it's in that kind of a, a context that we have to uh, think about, you know, what has happened last year and, and what are we facing this year, uh, while the World Bank predicts that in 2023, Sri Lanka's economy is going to contract by 4.2%, in other words, negative 4.2% growth, um, I would say it's very likely that over the course of the year, we're going to see a lot of revisions, and we are possibly looking at um, an economic contraction on the order of what's happened last year. Um, so this is clearly a very worrying situation. A lot of data by UN agencies are pointing to um, the Sri Lankan population, uh, very high levels of poverty and, and severe food insecurity where, you know, as much as a quarter or a third of a population going through uh, such severe food insecurity. We are seeing uh, a lot of jobs lost, a lot of small and medium enterprises have collapsed. And uh, Sri Lanka's economy, like much of uh, the rest of uh, in the global south, is largely the informal uh, sector, uh, which uh, is somewhere between 60 to 70% of our people work in the informal sector, so they do not get a monthly wage. Uh, and you know, their livelihoods are in agriculture or fisheries. Um, and, and those, uh, and that population is, uh, their livelihoods are greatly uh, disrupted. Unskilled day wage uh, labor, um, their incomes have halved. Um, so, and, and, and that's nominal wages we are talking about, right? If they were earning uh, 30,000 uh, Sri Lankan uh, rupees, which is about uh, 80 US dollars a month um, a year ago, they are probably now earning half that amount. While, uh, and this is also from a UN uh, World Food Program, FAO Rapid, survey done in September last year. While nominal incomes have dropped, food inflation has reached as high as 90% year on year late last year. 
and inflation more generally has reached something like 65%. So in other words, nominal wages have halved for uh, many of our unskilled laboring population, but their food costs have doubled. Um, so across the board, there has been no increase in uh, nominal wages. Um, and with inflation at 65%, it's effectively their real incomes have reduced by 40%. So I, th I think the, the data, the, the situation points to uh, not just uh, an economic depression in terms of the decline in GDP growth uh, or contraction of GDP growth, but you know, devastating consequences for the daily lives of people and even their capacity to provision food. But nobody in Sri Lanka is talking about an economic depression. There are some uh, voices about the rising uh, cost of uh, living. But what the entire focus is on, both internationally and by the Sri Lankan establishment, is on what they're calling inflation. Um, now, they claim that this 65% uh, year on year inflation, which uh, peaked, is uh, now starting to decline. Um, now, inflation uh, is not just a topic of discussion in, in, in Sri Lanka, but also globally in the Western economies as well. But what has caused this inflation or what we can call uh, price hikes, because uh, the economic establishment in Sri Lanka, Central Bank, uh, our finance ministry, their approach to addressing, they claim that by increasing interest rates and slowing down the economy, so to speak, that they're going to control inflation. And if you look at uh, Sri Lanka's monetary board and their announcement after uh, every monetary board meeting, or they say, oh, now the situation is getting better. Inflation is decreasing. That, um, that the, uh, the tremendous rise in inflation is now starting to decline. And um, hopefully that it would again come down to single digits by the end of the year. There's no mystery here. This is a no brainer. Um, the reason for the price hikes, you know, what they're calling inflation in the case of Sri Lanka is because of the devaluation of the rupee, overnight devaluation of the rupee about a year ago in March, 2022 when the rupee was devalued from 200 rupees to a US dollar to 360 rupees overnight. And all of that was passed on to the consumers. The next thing that happened is they cut all the subsidies. So whatever people were paying for in terms of food and other essential goods such as uh, fuel, and electricity, all subsidies were cut. They decided to market price energy costs. In addition, there were the global high price hikes in commodities with the war in Ukraine a year ago. If you look at fuel prices, um, and for that matter, fertilizer prices, prices uh, in the case of petrol and diesel have tripled. Kerosene oil used by our fisher folk and uh, the urban poor for their, uh, as, as for cooking needs or irrigation by small farmers for the irrigation farms. Kerosene oil has quadrupled in price. The price of chemical fertilizers has 
the, the government's subsidized price is 10,000 rupees a 50 kilogram bag um, of urea, whereas it was 1,500 rupees uh, two years ago. So all of this, a sudden one-time price hike is what led to that 65% inflation figure. It's a one-time price hike and inflation is calculated year on year. So once we pass those months, so that happened between February and till about June, July. So it's a no brainer by July, our inflation year on year would come down to single digits. Unless of course, there are further price hikes or there is pressure to increase wages, but wages have not increased. So if you look at it year on year, in July this year, our inflation data would show single digits, but the cost of living of people would remain the same because real wages compared to a year ago or two years ago would be 40% less. So what this is, what they're doing is not controlling inflation. It is an extreme form of wage repression. And this is also not uh, being discussed in, 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 uh, in Sri Lanka. So uh, this is a way in which uh, our central bank, our economic establishment are deceiving the public. What the data is showing in terms of their inflation data with the lived realities of people are completely uh, different. Now, how have they, how are they claiming to control inflation? Uh, the central bank policy rate um, early last year was raised from 6% to 15.5%, two and a half time increase in interest rates, which means that uh, small businesses, um, their working capital needs, if they are to invest or even for their working capital, is now if they're borrowing from commercial banks, it's you know anywhere between 25 to 30% during an economic depression. So no wonder so many businesses are going bankrupt and a lot of people are being thrown out of their jobs. If you look at what has happened to pawning rates, now pawning of gold jewelry in uh, our part of the world uh, is, is the recourse that rural folk have uh, or the urban poor have for as an emergency liquid asset. Pawning rates a year ago was 9%. Now, even if they go pawn it in uh, commercial banks, it's anywhere between 24% to 30%. And, and gold prices having increased and them having no recourse, but to go and pawn it at, at, at such high interest rates, what we are going to see is the dispossession of this emergency liquid asset of our rural folk, right? So this, this, uh, this increase in interest rates and maintaining it at such high levels is having devastating impact. It is rationalized by claiming that this is the way to control inflation while I've listed the, the real reasons for uh, the price hikes as uh, due to a range of other factors. Now, there is also a, a global question here about interest rates and inflation, because what we are seeing is central banks around the world have also uh, increased their uh, interest rates, claiming to, uh, claiming to fight uh, inflation. And um, what, the consequence of that is, of course, is that the borrowing costs for countries in the global south have greatly increased, and there's capital flight from our countries to the Western uh, metropolis. Uh, so this uh, means that uh, 
the spreads for borrowing become much higher, though um, Sri Lanka, as I will show briefly below, has defaulted. So the possibility of borrowing is not. But for the other countries, it becomes much higher. And it's pushing other countries into a debt crisis. Uh, so uh, why this focus on inflation when economies are collapsing under an economic uh, depression is what is reflective um, of what I would call the kind of unraveling of the global order. In other words, the global order being unable to address this tremendous unfolding uh, crisis. Uh, and the inability to address this crisis through some form of uh, global response is particularly devastating for the global south. Uh, and it's manifested, of course, in a debt crisis, similar to what we saw in the 1970s and 1980s, and, and possibly far worse if this situation uh, continues without an adequate framework for debt relief. But I will have much more to say about that uh, in my lecture on uh, March 1st. Uh, and this crisis is also tied to a very uh, serious food and energy crisis uh, globally and, and puts at stake the, the survival and even uh, the future of another generation. What we are looking at is another lost decade or worse if this situation uh, continues. And it raises questions about uh, the continuation of the hegemonic regime of uh, accumulation, uh, including uh, the export uh, economic led economic model and its related possibilities of economic growth. In other words, the model that had been uh, propagated uh, throughout the last four and a half decades is now in, in, in question because it's, it's not capable of providing uh, the kind of accumulation, even in the interest of uh, capital. Um, so with that, sort of long uh, context of, of, of what I'm calling an economic uh, depression, I want to uh, trace uh, a bit of uh, Sri Lanka's economic history uh, to show uh, how we got here to, to provide some uh, context um, uh, because I know a lot of the participants are, uh, here are not from Sri Lanka and to get uh, a broader context, right? Um, and I, as I always say, um, Sri Lanka is not, it's an island, but not an economic uh, island. Uh, it has always been influenced by uh, global political economic developments. Sri Lanka went through four and a half centuries of colonial rule. Um, first the Portuguese, then the Dutch, and the last 150 years uh, um, uh, under British uh, colonialism. And, and that has shaped the trajectory of our economy. Uh, but I'm gonna uh, start in the late colonial period uh, the 1930s for the reason that we all know that the global economy uh, went through a great uh, depression with uh, tremendous um, fallout uh, for um, the globally as well as for uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and I compare the economic shift underway both in Sri Lanka and globally as parallel to what happened in the 
uh, 30s. I, I see this as a major historical turning point. Uh, the 1930s, uh, interestingly for Sri Lanka, was very similar to what it's been going through starting two years ago. In, uh, even as the global economy was going into the Great Depression, Sri Lanka went through a malaria epidemic, a malaria crisis where 2% of our population died and tremendous disruption. So similar to the COVID-19 crisis, Sri Lanka went through this uh, uh, malaria crisis. Um, and along with that uh, famine and economic devastation, but it also had uh, tremendous political uh, consequences. There was the emergence of the uh, left movement, uh, 1935, youth who had participated in relief for malaria formed the first uh, leftist political party, the Lanka Samasamaja party in uh, 1935. And this sort of leftist ideas contributed uh, eventually in the 1940s, even as um, more and more power was uh, devolved for the, for the locals through what were called state councils. And Sri Lanka was the first country in Asia to gain uh, universal suffrage back in uh, 1931. So all of that contributed to the formation of a robust uh, social welfare program starting uh, even before independence. Um, so Sri Lanka to date, even today, started uh, almost eight years ago as free education policies. So free education from primary school all the way up through university. So I teach in a university, all our universities are officially state universities. And uh, to date, there's still uh, free education, but that might also be under threat with the current crisis. Um, Sri Lanka has had uh, free healthcare um, from the 1950s onwards. Amidst the, and, and, and the same to this day, anybody can go and get uh, admitted in a, in a general hospital. And in terms of actual medical care, uh, you get much better care in the, the state hospitals, even though uh, the private hospitals are built to be like uh, hotels and um, with other luxuries, but most of the specialists working in the private hospitals are moonlighting in the evenings, uh, holding jobs in the, uh, the, the state uh, hospitals. In 1942, amidst the Second World War, uh, the colonial officials introduced a food subsidy and rationing, and also uh, gave the impetus to greatly expand uh, the cooperative movement uh, in, in Sri Lanka. <laughs> cooperatives have a history going back to the 1910s, but it's during uh, the period of the Second World War that almost 5,000 uh, consumer cooperatives were expanded as a system for uh, food rationing and uh, distribution. So this extensive uh, social welfare uh, system created as a response to the Great Depression um, continued for the next few decades and, and, and many of those systems continue uh, to date. Soon after independence, um, with the formation of the post-colonial state, our uh, economy uh, by many political economists uh, is being characterized as a dependent economy. Uh, created by colonial structures. So our uh, export uh, uh, product, our main foreign earner for uh, over the last two centuries has been uh, plantation crops, particularly uh, tea over the uh, last 150 years before that coffee and then rubber coconut. So uh, it was a plantation economy that we inherited and independence and the, the plantations uh, labor uh, were brought over as indentured labor and many would argue a, a contemporary form uh, 
of uh, slavery, indentured labor brought over from South India to work in the tea plantations. And the original sin of our post-colonial state soon after ind independence was the disenfranchisement of uh, the hill country Tamils, as they are called, claiming that uh, they are not uh, Siwanese, as, as, as Sri Lanka was called at that time. And while they had the franchise in an act of uh, uh, majoritarian uh, disenfranchisement, they were disenfranchised. And um, you know, that was the first act that led to uh, many other acts of discrimination against uh, minorities. But the, the, the point I also want to make here is that the wealth of Sri Lanka over the last 200 years uh, was built by uh, this plantation community who faced a uh, horrendous form of uh, exploitation and even uh, disenfranchisement. And this year, uh, 2023, marks the 200th year anniversary of um, the arrival of Hill Country Tamils to Sri Lanka. Soon after uh, independence, you know, we had to build uh, many of our institutions. Um, we were under the uh, orbit of uh, our colonial power of Britain. Um, and they left Sri Lanka in 1948 quite confident that they were leaving behind a very loyal uh, comprado elite. Um, and that uh, the United National Party, which uh, uh, gained uh, power, uh, had uh, 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 finance minister J. R. J. Wardena, who's very important for the political and economic history of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, as finance minister, he was thinking about Sri Lanka's uh, financial future and the kind of systems to build. And he did not go to London. He actually went to Washington and sought the help of the US Federal Reserve to uh, create a central bank for Sri Lanka. Um, and John Exeter, a US Federal Reserve official who came and did a report, claimed that, look, you've got your sovereignty, but you really don't have monetary sovereignty because your rupee is pegged to the sterling pound. And, and this is a time uh, when global hegemony is continuing on the shift away from Britain towards the US and you need your own uh, central bank and it's now the, the, uh, the US order. And we came out with a report and interestingly, the first three years uh, of our central bank from 1950 to 53, our first central bank governor was uh, this US Federal Reserve official, John Exeter. And just as the central bank was being formed, in 1951, uh, the World Bank, which was only formed six years earlier, came on a massive mission uh, to Sri Lanka um, and uh, came out with a, a thousand page report titled The Development of uh, Ceylon, where they prescribed a continuation of uh, the dependent economy strategy. So focus on uh, agricultural production, the continuation of the plantation economy and uh, development of the dry zone to the detriment of developing local industries. So we, so we remained uh, dependent on uh, imports and uh, the, the plantation economy dependent on uh, the old colonial elite in terms of the export uh, of the plantation crops. But this was not uh, sustainable. And in 1953, Sri Lanka went through a major balance of 
uh, payment crisis. Um, so that crisis exactly 70 years ago uh, is very similar to the kind of uh, crisis we are going through now, where with the end of uh, the Korean War, um, the Korean War, you know, up to 1952, when uh, Sri Lanka was able to export um, rubber at much higher prices for the, the war machinery uh, internationally. And with the end of the war and the fall in rubber prices, we had a foreign exchange uh, crisis, which prompted the government at that time uh, to triple the price of rice. In other words, we were only 25% self-sufficient in rice. We had a food subsidy, as I had mentioned, from the, the, the time of the Second World War. And to, to reduce that uh, subsidy and to dampen the demand for rice, in August 1953, they tripled the price of rice from 25 cents a measure to 70 cents a measure, leading to um, one of the largest protests uh, in the history of the country called the, the Great Haltal of 1953. And I think that was unprecedented uh, until, of course, the huge protests that you would have all seen in, uh, uh, on television and so on uh, last year on July, in July 2022. Similar again, history seems to repeat itself. Um, in 1953, the, the government was so shaken that the cabinet had to meet on a British warship. Uh, the prime minister uh, resigned, uh, not different from the way in which our President Gotabaya Rajapaksa ran away from Sri Lanka uh, last year. But that crisis uh, signified a shift for Sri Lanka as three years later, that Comprado regime was thrown out and a new uh, government, uh, an intermediate regime consisting of uh, various forces uh, came to power along with also the support of some uh, left forces. And uh, not only that, Sri Lanka, uh, this was a year after the Bandung conference uh, turned to the non-aligned uh, movement. Uh, there was a focus on um, land reform, agriculture, and an effort to shift away from the, work, the, the World Bank's rec recommendations and to build uh, local industries and the consolidation of the, the social welfare measures uh, came about in the next two decades from 1956 to uh, 1976, to the extent that in the 1970s, Sri Lanka, for its very high human development indicators, despite its low per capita income, uh, was considered uh, a model uh, development, developing economy. I think Sri Lanka, Cuba, and the Indian state of Kerala during that time were considered such models mainly for a high human development indicators. Nevertheless, uh, the 1970s was also a time of, again, uh, a global crisis, the, the long global downturn of you know, what is commonly called the, the golden age of capitalism with the post-Second uh, World War boom, the Marshall Plan, the reconstruction of Europe and Japan, which led to very uh, high levels of uh, global growth, a new social contract, with uh, higher incomes for labor uh, started to collapse uh, globally. And uh, the OPEC oil shock were similar to last year, uh, global oil prices uh, though remained high for a long period of time, quadrupled in the, 19, uh, the mid 1970s. All of that had 
a tremendous impact on Sri Lanka. And, and Sri Lanka was going through an experiment with the United Front government, which was a, a government where the left parties came in coalition um, with the Sri Lanka Freedom uh, Party. And uh, they were trying to uh, bring about a form of state socialism, uh, but which could not be uh, sustained. About that um, experiment and, and even uh, the ideas of self-sufficiency that got planted at that time, <clears throat> my comrade um, Devaka Gunawadhan and I have a paper in the, in, in the International Quarterly of Asian Studies um, kind of detailing the, <clears throat> the, both the attempts and the failure of that a major experiment in uh, Sri Lanka. Maybe I can uh, share that with any of you if it's of uh, interest. And as the economic crisis uh, continued, and remember that you know, compared to 1950s by the 1970s, terms of trade for countries like Sri Lanka, which were mainly uh, commodity producing countries in, in Sri Lanka, in Africa, and so on, had greatly deteriorated. Almost one third uh, the prices for our commodities compared to what we were uh, importing and, and much of the capital goods and so on we had to uh, import. And this led to restrictions and prioritizing of imports. Um, and in the case of Sri Lanka during the 1970s with its turn to non-alignment and um, towards the Soviet Union and the kind of a uh, leftist turn in our politics, there was a capital strike by the West. So there was very little capital coming in uh, the World Bank and other multilateral institutions decided to teach Sri Lanka a lesson, worsening the crisis in uh, Sri Lanka to the point where there was an overwhelming backlash uh, with the right coming to power. And no other figure than J.R. Jayawardena, who was the finance minister in 1948 to uh, the 50s that I mentioned, uh, who had this vision of liberalization and the turn towards the West and particularly the United States uh, coming to power uh, as prime minister in 1977. And he took Sri Lanka away from non-alignment completely into the US orbit at a time when even India was still uh, with the non-aligned movement, creating both a political uh, shift uh, liberalization and, and structural adjustment with two consecutive uh, IMF agreements in late 1977 and 78. Um, and in order to push those through, in 1978, he created an executive presidency, uh, you, you know, taking all power uh, to this individual who became the executive president. So from being prime minister, he became executive president. Uh, the following years, he uh, brought about emergency rule, the Prevention of Terrorism Act, so that can be uh, hard repression of the minorities and organized labor. And in 1980, he crushed the labor unions uh, when they went for a uh, general strike from which the trade unions to this day have not recovered the kind of uh, repression that he brought about. But he also brought about all that towards what he called the open economy uh, reforms. And he's famously uh, said, let the robber balance come, that he was opening the economy, uh, free trade zones where there would be no uh, labor rights and created the urbanization of uh, uh, Colombo uh, through the greater Colombo economic uh, cooperation. And uh, and focus on exports and trade liberalization, including the imports of uh, agriculture. So it was a, a complete shift. The neoliberal turn had arrived and, and Sri Lanka was the first country in, in South Asia to uh, take this uh, neoliberal uh, turn. Now, the World Bank started its major development project uh, 
to reward Jai Vardhana for this uh, turn. To date, our biggest development project, the Acceleration Accelerated Mahadali Development Scheme, uh, to further develop the, the dry zone. Um, and uh, there was a bubble of growth. And I think this is characteristic of uh, neoliberal growth. So we were again very high levels of growth in 1979, 1980, 81. But as that investment started to peter out and the IMF and the World Bank started to uh, ask for further belt tightening measures, the economic bubble started to burst. And I would argue that that was one of the reasons uh, for the um, July 1983 program where Jayavardhana attempting to deflect from the economic crisis uh, went on a singular nationalist, singular Buddhist nationalist campaign against the Tamil minority, um, which eventually led also to the emergence of the civil war. And this is at a time when India was also very antagonistic towards Sri Lanka. So the, so the neoliberal policies that he started in the 1980s, sorry, 19, late 1970s, could not be sustained at that accelerated path because suddenly Sri Lanka was, uh, the government was fighting uh, a civil war, a long protracted 26 year long war, which definitely devastated uh, the northern and eastern parts of the country and, and, and uh, Jaffna, where I live and teach now. Um, and, but also the Sri Lankan economy, uh, by many estimates, you know, our GDP 26 years later is a half or a third, if not for the long uh, protracted civil war. The uh, devastating end to the civil war, the calamitous end in uh, Mulati, where tens of thousands of people were uh, massacred uh, when the LTT held the local population captive and the military mercilessly uh, went to <coughs> destroy the LTT in May 2009, coincided with, again, a global development, the global economic crisis of uh, 2008, the global financial crisis coincided with the end of the uh, civil war. And soon after, uh, there was huge amounts of global capital flowing into the emerging markets. But Sri Lanka was also seen as not just an emerging market, but a post-war economy. Uh, that was promising for global investment. And um, so another uh, bubble uh, came to Sri Lanka, which I have called the second wave of neoliberalism in Sri Lanka. The first wave being in the, in the 1970s, late 1970s with the neoliberal term, and the second wave uh, after the war, when huge amounts of global capital uh, flows into Sri Lanka. To give you a sense, in uh, uh, 2010, in the course of 18 months, Sri Lanka's stock market was the best performing stock market in the world. Uh, it quadrupled in uh, market capitalization. Um, Sri Lanka went on a uh, spurge of commercial borrowings, particularly international uh, sovereign bonds. Um, there was the uh, uh, expansion of uh, capital markets where they continue to uh, bubble up both the domestic, uh, uh, the Colombo Stock Exchange, including through all kinds of maneuvers there in uh, between 2012, uh, 11 and 12, about three uh, chairpersons of the Securities and Exchange Commission were changed to try to keep it uh, at, at high market capitalization. There was the beautification of Colombo when uh, President Rajapaksa's brother, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, was defense secretary, 
there was a merging of defense and uh, urban development. Urban development authority was brought under the defense ministry. All of this to be able to absorb the global capital that they were inviting in and it was flowing in. So it, it was all absorbed in real estate and infrastructure. Uh, and, and Sri Lanka was the, the, the darling of um, global capital. We showed uh, eight to 10 percent growth uh, in 2010, 11, and 12. But it was a bubble without returns. And as the economy started to peter out, uh, the Rajapaksa government at this time used the same tactic. This time they created a new enemy in the Muslim community and anti-Muslim programs drawing on uh, the sort of uh, war on terror, global Islamophobic, the Islamophobia in India that is so uh, prevalent was also that kind of ideology was borrowed here and uh, used against our Muslim uh, community. But nevertheless, uh, their focus on urbanization, the neglect of their rural constituencies led to regime change in 2015, where you know, the Rajapaksas had done, which no other government had done, won the civil war uh, and had a landslide victory in the 2010 elections. But just five years later, Sri Lanka, uh, the citizenry throughout uh, overthrew this regime democratically and there was regime change. But the government that came to power again continued on that neoliberal path. In fact, they uh, floated even more international sovereign bonds. I mean, there's an irony about uh, international sovereign bonds because the Rajapaksas who always talked about sovereignty, they attacked the Tamil minority and claimed they're protecting sovereignty. They attacked the Muslim community and they claimed they're protecting sovereignty. And they are the ones who initiated the sale of sovereign bonds, which led eventually to the bankruptcy of Sri Lanka uh, last year. But that policy of floating sovereign bonds was also continued by the Sirisena, uh, Vikramasena government. Um, of course, with very positive report cards um, from the IMF. There was an IMF agreement in 2009, soon after the war, and again in 2016. And every time we got an IMF agreement, we went and borrowed. But on that, I will have much more to say uh, in my lecture on Wednesday, where I will focus on what I'm calling the IMF trap that Sri Lanka has fallen into. Um, the continuation of this uh, policies of commercial borrowings and investment in uh, real estate and infrastructure without uh, returns uh, continued in the late 2010s, um, but there was the Easter terror attacks, which you might remember on, on, on Easter Sunday uh, in April 2019, which put a dampener on tourism earnings. It led to the return of the Rajapaksas, not only because of the Easter Sunday attacks, but because the government at that time neglected a long drought between 2016 and 2017 where they also neglected the, the rural agricultural community. So there's a return of the Rajapaksa regime, again with a landslide victory where Gotabaya Rajapaksa uh, came to power with an unprecedented uh, uh, election uh, victory uh, and in a, a state of hubris, even as the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis came about, they provided very little uh, relief. They had um, cut taxes soon after they came to power to keep the business communities that supported them happy. And uh, with very little revenues, there was Sri Lanka was provided the least amount of relief in South Asia during the COVID crisis in 2020 and 2021. 
and worse, as the balance of payment crisis uh, or problems started to mount in 2020 and 2021, because tourism was completely disrupted, uh, foreign remittances and other major income, foreign income earners was also greatly reduced. Um, Rajapaksa made this sort of disastrous move to ban chemical fertilizers overnight, which meant last year, the consequence, even though he had to uh, withdraw that ban, the consequence was that 40% of uh, agricultural production is estimated to have dropped last year. Not only that, um, by uh, early 2023, uh, with the war in Ukraine and as global commodity prices and global um, oil prices in particular, if you compare that with the, uh, the bottoming out in 2020, it quadrupled in February, March 2022 compared to what the prices were in April 2020. So Sri Lanka couldn't finance uh, the fuel needed. Um, in 2021, even amidst this huge crisis, there were no moves to prioritize imports or to reduce our import bill. Right? Even though we are in the midst of a balance of payment crisis, the, the, this idea that you should not touch trade liberalization, which had become so entrenched um, that in 2021 was the year with the highest levels of imports in Sri Lanka, just before the crisis. So there was no move uh, to control our import bill. And our foreign exchange, you know, continue to foreign exchange reserves continue to collapse by <clears throat> whereby uh, February, March 2022, we had next to very, you know, not even a few weeks uh, worth of uh, exchange to work for imports. And instead of prioritizing imports and uh, making sure that we um, have foreign reserves for our essential goods, there was a huge cry from the neoliberal establishment, including from the opposition and our neoliberal think tanks that Sri Lanka should default on its debt, go for an IMF agreement, get bridge financing and restructure our debt. Now, I will have much more to say about what I call a premature default, which has pushed us into an IMF trap in my next lecture on um, Wednesday. Um, but for now, what all this has meant is that Sri Lanka has been pushed over the cliff into what I started with, uh, a very deep and devastating uh, depression. We're gonna to have to rethink our fundamentals. While the neoliberal establishment thinks that we can again go back towards commercial borrowing, that you know, we can go back to their rosy days of uh, the 2010s, uh, in my view, that's, impossible and even on their terms it's not going to be possible for that kind of a return the the scenarios that we are looking at for sri lanka is continued wage repression wage repression on the scale so that the cost of labor in sri lanka becomes competitive with countries like bangladesh the huge devastation of the high human development indicators that i mentioned so that capital can start accumulating again. So that is one uh, possible scenario. The huge privatization, the fire sale of uh, uh, assets, which are so critical for the, 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 the social welfare of our country, whether it's electricity, now almost 100% of our people, 99% of our people have access to the electricity grid. But over the last year, for many of them, electricity charges have increased by as much as 
300%. And there are moves now to privatize the Ceylon Electricity Board. There is a very controversial deal with the Adani Group uh, where they've been given a contract to build uh, 500 megawatts of uh, wind power in Northern Sri Lanka. So all of this is on the cards for large international Western and Indian conglomerates to come and uh, benefit from this fire sale of assets as a way of you know, paying for uh, the, the luxurious consumption of our uh, elite, uh, the, the huge inequalities that have characterized this 45 year long march of neoliberalism in uh, Sri Lanka and to continue that further. So that is, th those are a couple scenarios or the other scenario is what we've seen that cycles of protest, of regime changes, and it's not just going to take one election and another government to address it, but the revolving door of politics. What we saw, for example, during the last decade in Greece, where in one decade, we, I think there were seven prime ministerial changes. So the kind of long, decade-long depression that Sri Lanka is likely to go through is probably like to be, likely to be paralleled by similar political changes that may also lead to uh, a radical change in the kind of economic vision. Um, the agrarian question might come to the fore because the state is completely bankrupt. Austerity measures mean that there's no relief being provided by the state, no investment by the state. The only resource that the state has are natural resources, land, and as an island, our seas. Um, just last week in parliament, our foreign minister came out and said that he's talking to the Indian foreign minister about providing licenses for Indian fishermen to come and fish in the Northern Sri Lankan waters. And this despite two decades of poaching by Indian trawlers, undermining the natural resource base of Northern Sri Lanka, the devastation of a Northern fishers. And I've been involved in a five year long research project with the fishing community on this Indian trolley conflict. And now our foreign minister comes out and says that they're considering giving licenses to Indian fishermen so that the income earned by such licenses uh, would be important for Sri Lanka. So this sale, this fire sale of not just assets, but also the, the sale of our natural resources is at stake on the one hand. On the other hand, these are also the kind of times when uh, people's mobilizations could lead to a redrawing of uh, the kind of economic model that we pursue with a focus on local production, the rural, and the re-emergence of possibly uh, the land question. So uh, a lot is open and at stake in terms of um, where Sri Lanka is headed. Um, but a lot of that is also going to depend on what happens globally. As I said at the outset, Sri Lanka is not an economic island. And what various global powers do, uh, Sri Lanka is also a pawn in a geopolitical game of China, India, and the United States. And as the devastation continues in Sri Lanka, they are more concerned about their self-interest. And it is a game that's being played at huge cost to the working people of Sri Lanka and, and, and what 
outcome comes out will also depend on the global structures and how they prevail on Sri Lanka. So I think I'll uh, stop there and I, and I look forward uh, to the discussion uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aydar. We can take questions and comments from the audience now. Those who wish to raise a question or comment, please raise your hand or you can write in the chat box. Students in the class, if you have any question, you can use the mic. Yes, yes, Uma, please go ahead. Yeah, so, um, Professor, I was uh, just, uh, as you mentioned before, that there's a uh, uh, COVID crisis uh, affect this uh, Sri, Sri Lankan economy. So I want your uh, own uh, view regarding that, that how much this COVID crisis affect the uh, Sri Lankan economy and how much the political decisions uh, played a role in it. So, or other aspect also, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Uma. That's an important question. If others have uh, questions, then maybe I can take a few questions uh, together, or if you have any comments also. Uh, I think I've been talking for nonstop for about an hour, so uh, I'd appreciate some comments and so on, and I, I will definitely address your question. <clears throat> Sir, I am Priya. So, um, Sri Lanka has seen so much collapse now, till, till now, after COVID-19, it's all destruction. So, is it possible for Sri Lanka to recover from the previous um, from this situation and to regain the stand of living which it's uh, enjoying before this collapse or thank you thank you priya we have it uh, yes pro please yes. Thank you for this very interesting input. I'm talking to you from Germany. I'm um, I'm a lecturer in the German University in Kassel, and uh, uh, what, what I'm doing in my research is following up the, the 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 influence of donors in terms of restructuring also financial systems, so they can observe the uh, the the focus on private capital, uh, on 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 so, for example establishing. Uh, sovereign bond, local currency bond market, sovereign bond markets, etc. Can you shortly compare the role of, you mentioned it shortly, and you referred to your lecture on Wednesday to focus a bit on more on this issue, but nonetheless, as you mentioned, and I dare to ask <laughs> it now, so in comparison to other countries being in, highly indebted at the moment, uh, and we know it also from Ghana, that Ghana was very much uh, focusing on raising uh, uh, external sovereign bonds and came into a severe crisis, debt crisis with it. So in comparison to other uh, countries in the global south, is, is Sri Lanka outstanding in uh, taking up uh, 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 euro bonds or like external sovereign, uh, like uh, so, uh, issuing so uh, sovereign bonds to external investors? And the second question coming with it, what is the role of um, of, of donors, of donor governments in restructuring the financial market in Sri Lanka in order to be able to observe these or to deepen the capital markets in, in Sri Lanka? 
because my, the background of my question is that the Kiev, 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 KFW, German Development Bank, was really pushing uh, for for or really much pushing in, uh, to 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 restructure financial markets or financial systems, especially in Africa. So my question is whether you see the same or similar development, similar process also in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you, Prague. Um, so I think I'll take those uh, questions. And there's a question uh, in the uh, chat by Rojalini. Uh, considering the failure of neoliberal policy, what can be the alternative to IMF or World Bank and how Western hegemony can be taken care of mostly in, in South Asia? OK. Um, Okay, I think I'll, I'll, I'll start with these um, uh, questions and um, hopefully there'll be more questions and, and, and uh, comments. Um, so I'll start with uh, Uma and uh, Uma's question, I think. Um, so the immediate causes of the crisis. Now, I, I think my argument is that this is a, a, a a long crisis in the making, right? This has, I trace it to the late 1970s, the neoliberal turn, where we liberalized trade, we allowed the capital to flow in, but then also capital flies out. We become much more focused on urbanization and infrastructure build out with our returns. And, and that goes into a kind of an accelerated mode particularly after the end of the civil war, what I call the second wave of uh, neoliberalism. Now in 2000, by 2016, uh, you know, Sri Lanka went in 2016 into its 16th IMF agreement, right? Soon after war in 2009, we had our 15th IMF agreement, which allowed us Give the green light to go and borrow more sovereign bonds. In 2016, we had our 16th IMF agreement. And uh, many of us at that time wrote saying, look, the, the, the debt is become uh, unsustainable in uh, Sri Lanka and we're headed towards a crisis. So it was clear to us because uh, the kind of uh, commercial borrowings that Sri Lanka was getting into and the kind of uh, investment without returns, it was clear to us we were headed towards crisis. So my view is that we were inevitably going to fall into the crisis in 2019-20, when the COVID hit, it was the kind of disruption that pushed us over the cliff. And even as we were falling over the cliff, our government did nothing to address uh, the crisis, right? They, they could have uh, prioritized imports, um, reduced our uh, expenditure, focused on the food system to be able to provide relief to the people and so on. But there, were no, there was no change in the direction. They assumed that the COVID crisis would go away and, and tourism would pick up and we could go back to where we were. And, and that is what the donors were also saying. I mean, the, the uh, World Bank and IMF, none of them talked about prioritizing imports. Um, and so this is what happens in, in so many countries in the global south. While the bubble is booming, everybody, there are lots of cheerleaders, particularly from the international financial institutions. And when it starts to collapse, they say, oh, here's crony capitalism and mismanagement. If there's mismanagement, the mismanagement, in my view, has been there for the four and a half decades in the kind of flawed model that uh, we took forward. And that mismanagement comes straight from the recommendations of the IMF and the development programs that the World Bank and other multilateral organizations, in our case, the Asian Development Bank, had been uh, promoting. So, uh, in, in that sense, yes, COVID kind of pushed us over the cliff. The situation got even worse with what the, the arrogant regime was doing and, and continues to do even after regime change. Um, in my lecture on uh, 
Wednesday, I will talk about what's happened over the last year since Sri Lanka defaulted, how this devastation has gotten so bad, 10% contraction, the policies that we're taking even today, which is making the situation worse. It's not just about the past, it's a continuation of those uh, policies. So um, that's, uh, I think, the, 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 the point that I want to make. The COVID disruption created the pressures, but we were already in that uh, trajectory and the, the COVID disruption for not only Sri Lanka, for many countries has brought to the fore this very problematic neoliberal uh, economic trajectory that we were on. And this is a time when we have to very seriously re rethink that uh, trajectory. Uh, now, I think uh, I, I'll come to Kriya's uh, um, question and along with uh, Rojali's uh, uh, question. But before that, uh, Fra's question about the role of uh, donors and the kind of uh, the role of uh, sovereign bonds. Um, now, if we look at uh, Sri Lanka's foreign debt, the, the structure of the foreign debt goes through drastic changes in the 2010s. One, with the kind of bubbled up economy, from being a low-income country, we are promoted to a middle-income country, right? So being promoted to a middle-income country means that, and, and you know, the best uh, the, the, uh, economy in that sense in South Asia, supposedly, right? Because we've reached middle-income status, but on this sort of bubbled up infrastructure boom that uh, happened uh, during uh, the second wave of neoliberalism, as I called it, which meant that we don't qualify for concessionary financing. And the World Bank and the IMF, all of them say, okay, now you guys should, you know, you have, you're matured, go and borrow, you know, get commercial borrowings. So when we look at our structure of our debt, when we uh, defaulted, 53% of our debt is commercial borrowing. 53%, right? Uh, or of the total debt, 40% is international sovereign bonds. And if you look at, the, you know, it's very simple to get the data on international sovereign bonds. If you look at international sovereign bonds, which we started, the first one was floated in 2007, a 500 million US dollar bond. So it's only the last 15 years, and then, then multiples of them uh, in, over the last uh, decade. The average interest rate is 7.5%. Annual interest is 7.5%. These are dollar denominated bonds. So if it's a 10 year sovereign bond, most of them are 10 year terms. In 10 years, if you do the compound interest calculation, the interest payment is equal to the principal, right? I mean, so it's just pure extraction. And this is a time when global interest rates were near zero, right? In, the, in, the, in Germany or in the United States, it's, it's near zero. In, in Japan, it's negative. And, and here, countries like Sri Lanka are paying, you know, in some years, 9% interest. I think Ghana last year went and borrowed in, 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 in the, uh, bonds on the order of 20 something percent. So it's obviously not sustainable. The bondholders have made a killing. And it's and and you are and then countries like Sri Lanka and uh, Ghana are thrown into uh, default. But this was the path that we were said. We were said, okay, go and borrow. Now you are a middle income country. You have matured into middle income status. You can go and borrow uh, uh, commercially, and you will be disciplined by the international rating agencies. So that's supposedly the the icing on the cake, right? That, um, uh, that you know, you'll be, and so the, this is the path to go. This is what uh, we were pushed into. And, and this is what has now led to the crisis. And, and then now suddenly it's all about crony capitalism, right? The, the structure of this, and the 52 countries in the global South today <clears throat> are in severe risk of debt crisis. Um, 
this was the path to that. And, and particularly when it comes to middle-income countries, then the share of their debt in terms of commercial borrowing is heavily weighted towards uh, the capital markets, Western capital. But the discourse in the Western media and from the Western capitals is that Sri Lanka has gone into a Chinese debt trap, right? Chinese debt, depending on whether it's directly state debt or also through uh, Chinese state enterprises is anywhere between only 10 to 20% of Sri Lanka's foreign debt. Whereas commercial borrowing is 53%. So, um, and so th that's the geopolitical kind of tussle where, you know, it's this blame game between China and the, and the West while, you know, Sri Lanka is dragged down the path to hell. Um, and so, and not only were we pushed to go and borrow internationally, um, and if you look at successive World Bank reports, it's about, all about building infrastructure through such uh, borrowing. Not only that, the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank in 2016-17, uh, uh, I believe, had a major project to uh, expand the Sri Lankan uh, capital markets, the, the, the Colombo Stock Exchange, right? I can't remember the exact amount, but I think it's on the order of uh, about 225 million US dollars, uh, which is huge for Sri Lanka, just focused on trying to encourage and develop a uh, stock exchange to expand it further to encourage uh, the kind of financialization within Sri Lanka, which had, you know, which had already been financialized in terms of capital account convertibility. There's another thing that happens in parallel in the 2010s, um, and I've done quite a bit of work on that, is the expansion of microfinance. So financialization at many levels globally, in terms of how our access to capital comes through uh, global capital markets, financialization in terms of the expansion of our financial sector, including our capital markets, our banking sector, the emergence of finance companies, and financialization at the very rural level, where the, the rural model for development is microfinance, right? And this is again funded by, including by many uh, uh, bilateral donors from Europe who, who fund local finance companies. And these finance companies initiate microfinance at the rural level, where when we calculated the annualized interest rates, it's anywhere from 60 to 300% annual interest rates. So it leads to huge dispossession in the countryside, even suicides of women who are targeted, and there was a huge uh, struggle against it. Now, uh, the other hat I wear is as uh, the chair of the Northern Cooperative Development Bank. So I'm, I'm an academic, I teach at the uh, university in Sri Lanka, but I'm also the chair of the Federation of 1,200 Cooperatives in the Northern Province of Autumn, Northern Province of Sri Lanka. And one big challenge for the, the cooperatives has been to take on this kind of financialization through an alternate form of cooperative uh, credit. And you know, I mentioned the emergence of uh, uh, the, the cooperatives and consumer cooperatives during the Second World War as a response to the crisis in the 1930s and 40s. I think as we think about alternatives, one thing to consider going forward is, is the future of uh, that kind of rural cooperatives related to the food system and so on. Um, now to come to uh, uh, Priya and uh, Rojali's question, you know, what does the future uh, look like? Um, now, it's, as I mentioned, we are in the, in the cusp of kind of global change. Um, the 1940s, 50s led to the non-aligned movement. Eventually there were even visions like the New International Economic Order in the 1970s. The, the chair of UNCTAD at that time, Gamni Goria, was actually a Sri Lankan when 
this idea of a new international economic order was put forward amidst this tremendous uh, devastating consequences of the, the changes in terms of, uh, terms of trade. But at that time, Sri Lanka could go through that kind of import substitution model and, and pursue a different model because they have a solidarity in the global south in terms of South-South relations where Sri Lanka could rely on that to even experiment. Now, the, the, the question going forward with this kind of crisis facing the global South, and these changes don't happen overnight over a couple of years, but possibly over a decade or two, whether there would be that kind of a change. What Sami Ramin called delinking, for example, from the West, uh, whether that kind of shift would happen uh, but there, you know, there are positive signs given that there isn't, doesn't seem to be any major shift yet in India in terms of uh, India's kind of uh, neoliberal path and the kind of authoritarian populist neoliberal regime there. Uh, because when I say Sri Lanka is not an economic island, a lot of that kind of change would depend on what happens in other countries in the global south and the kind of trade and investment relations we can form along with that. You know, what would be the future of uh, development financing given the failure of this kind of uh, commercial borrowings or the role of multilateral institutions like the World Bank and ADB in pushing countries like Sri Lanka into crisis? What would development financing look like uh, as we come out of uh, this crisis. For now, I would say that the, the focus uh, would be uh, to look at, uh, given the crisis, to focus on the food system because we are looking at very worrying dangers of a famine in Sri Lanka. And the whole uh, response to Sri Lanka has been to uh, a humanitarian response by the UN agencies, but they're not thinking of the sustainability of it. You, know, you can import rice from uh, India and China and the United States and Australia, but are you going to do that for the next uh, five, six, uh, 10 years? And actually that kind of humanitarian response can disrupt the local, disrupt local agricultural production. So the turn to the rural and taking the agrarian question very seriously, I think is important. One huge gap that I see even among uh, progressive uh, development economists, um, and I think you know, I would say this is perhaps a challenge for the Ideas Network as well, even as we are working on the whole question of uh, debt restructuring, to think about the debt crisis and its relationship to the agrarian uh, question. I think that is something that we should be taking seriously and thinking uh, as we think about moving forward, because to come back to Mas, uh, sorry, Priya's question about Sri Lanka regaining or at least maintaining the kind of uh, human development um, indicators and the kind of social welfare uh, regime, it would have to start by ensuring food and these kind of social services and thinking about growth differently, right? You don't need high growth, but how do we stabilize it? What we're doing now is claiming that there will be high growth later. We are just contracting and devastating the economy. Um, I think there's another question from Vijay Ram. How much of a role has economic circumstance of Sri Lanka played in the social conflict in the country apart from the social factors, social conflict? has also occurred often in Sri Lanka historically, even before neoliberalism. Uh, and so it's going to be worse because of the recent crisis. This is with reference to some kind of social unity and people coming together against the Rajapaksa government last year. That's one question. Uh, and Bhavani has a question. Do you see a rethinking approach needed that you mentioned happening? Sri Lanka is also vulnerable to climate change. Also within the country, is there unity in the country? Is there unity in thinking on the way forward and confidence, especially among the Tamils? 
So the minority question in, in relation to the economic uh, crisis. Um, while I think about that, any other questions or comments? I mean, more than questions, I'm also interested in comments, criticisms. Uh, uh, also, I, sir, I have a comment. So uh, there is uh, one of my relatives who is from Sri Lanka, but uh, currently living in Australia. So when when they were in India, they just was talking things from India and uh, going to Sri Lanka with that. So I was just shocked by uh, how how high is the prices for even very essential things. Then I asked what is the reason for the crisis and their opinion was that it is all because of China. So, uh, but then I was little skeptical about that comment. Then I, uh, now I just came through one of your interviews in Rethinking Sri Lanka's Economic Crisis. So I really liked your point how the focus is on the geopolitical situation rather than what, also your uh, lecture also explained it well, how the historical situations also have a role to play in this rather than uh, media's focusing on this geopolitical situation. So thank you so much for that, uh, uh, that aspect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your uh, comments. Anybody else? So I can take on this uh, question about minorities and social conflicts. And... Professor, I think we have these two for now. You can take on them and then we can ask if people have more questions. Sure. Um, well, I think that, that that's for me the, the worrying uh, concern. I think in my lecture, I mentioned how as we went, as you know, bubbles went into, uh, as bubbles burst first in the early 1980s, um, very chauvinist forces tried to deflect that crisis against the Tamil minority and even which escalated eventually into a civil war. Similarly, the bubble of the early 2010s uh, when it burst, uh, it also uh, went into um, an anti-Muslim sort of attack. Or even if we look at the crisis of 1953, and even though there was that huge progressive uh, resistance in the form of the Hartal of 1953, what I mentioned about uh, the, the increase in the rise of price with the balance of payment crisis. And even though it had, in a, in a way, some positive um, economic consequences, um, a shift in the regime towards, you know, globally also towards non-alignment, uh, import substitution. And Sri Lanka did something that no other country did uh, between 1953 and 1980 from being 25% self-sufficient in uh, rice, which is our staple, because, it, because that Hartal and that struggle sent shockwaves through our ruling regimes, in the next 25 years, we became 90% self-sufficient in rice, which is our staple, right? So the kind of agrarian changes that were brought about. So there were positive elements like that, but 1953 also led to 1956, the emergence of a single nationalist regime who brought about the singular only policy in Sri Lanka which was the beginning of uh, you know, severe forms of discrimination against the Tamil minority. So crises have this way even before neoliberalism as uh, Vijay Ram rightly pointed out to create social conflicts and provide the space for nationalists and chauvinist actors to mobilize certain constituencies. And I think that's my worry about the current crisis. Uh, it's, it's possible in both directions. One, it was very encouraging to see in this Gota Go Home uh, struggle last year where uh, different uh, 
ethnic and religious communities coming together with the same uh, slogan. It had a lot of resonance uh, among the youth in all communities, though the Tamil political establishment uh, were very careful not to join that because they felt that their nationalist demands would get watered down. In, in Sri Lanka, as in many countries, the, the nationalists on both ends of the spectrum are good friends. Uh, the, the singular nationalists need the Tamil nationalists uh, to be able to take forward their politics. And the same goes for Tamil nationalists. They, they, they depend on polarization and divided politics. So those forces are always at work, but, but, but what this showed is also the kind of democratic spirit of the people where the so-called war hero, Gotabaya Rajapaksa had to run away from the country, right? And, and also in the last six months, as the student movement has come under attack, uh, student leaders were uh, detained under the Prevention of Terrorism Act, uh, this horrible act that has for decades uh, devastated Tamil youth, Muslim youth, and, and to an extent, Sinhala youth also during the, the JVP insurrection in the 1980s. But for the first time, we saw Sinhala people coming out and calling for, in, in, in a major campaign, repeal of the PTA. So that there were these alliances that are being formed, huge possibilities for a new progressive politics to emerge, not overnight, but in the, in the years ahead. On the other hand, a crisis as severe as this with the kind of wage repression, the kind of authoritarianism that it uh, affords, the, the bring to fore of police and military repression. Even yesterday, we saw uh, the J, uh, an NPP uh, rally calling for elections after the uh, after the president has undermined the holding of elections in a hugely undemocratic act, local government elections to be held on March 9th. Uh, he claims there's no money in the country to hold elections as a way because he knows he will lose all uh, legitimacy with that election, even though he uh, lack, has even little legitimacy now. Um, and they uh, crushed that protest and one protester has died, which the news has just come out. So. With this kind of repression it, and this uh, huge instability in the country, it might also provide room for fascist forces to come to power because people on a day-to-day -day basis are finding uh, this crisis to be so cruel. So like the 90, I think the lesson from the 1930s and the Great Depression is that it can lead to social democratic and social welfare possibilities. It can also lead to authoritarian, even fascist regimes coming to power. And, um, and also globally, the crisis, if you, if, you, if you know our history from the 1930s, it led to fascism emerging globally, a shift in global hegemony and the economic order as well. And that's what I mean by the unraveling of the global order, that there is no solution that the Western powers, the hegemonic powers, whether the United States or the Western world can seem to provide to not just Sri Lanka, but so many countries in the global South that are facing this severe crisis. Professor, we have another question from Pratik Sool. He says, you made a statement about Sri Lanka turning to the IMF and defaulting prematurely, but you also highlighted a sort of inevitability to this crisis given Sri Lanka's neoliberal trajectory. So what makes the default premature? Were other policy options available? And at which point during the unfolding of the crisis were these options available? Um... Yeah, uh, thank you, Pratik. That's an important question. I, actually, that's going to be much of my lecture on uh, uh, March 1st, uh, uh, Wednesday, um, on, on what I call the, the premature default and, and, and what 
has happened. Um, but in a, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that um, if Sri Lanka continued on the neoliberal trajectory, this crisis was inevitable. The premature default was an effort by the neoliberal establishment to continue that neoliberal trajectory because they felt that with that default, Sri Lanka would have no option but to surrender to the IMF. That, that was their thinking. And um, so the, what we would have liked to see even at the very late stages is to avoid this level of devastation, what I'm calling the economic depression, this hard landing, this 10% contraction of the economy, which is devastating our people. It's not just about statistics and data where people are unable to afford their next day's meal, children are unable to go to school. To be able to avoid that kind of a devastating situation, uh, the premature default is was completely unhelpful and it's continuing uh, that devastation. But I have quite a bit to say about this uh, day after tomorrow. We have a few more minutes. If people have more comments, you are welcome to raise your hand. Please. If there are no more questions or comments, we could perhaps close this session now. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayran, for taking the time to deliver this lecture. And we look forward to your next lecture on March 1st. Thank you very much. And thank you to all for joining us today. Good yeah, one. thank you everyone for the very engaging uh, questions. And again, very happy to see uh, the Ideas Network uh, initiate this uh, uh, advanced certificate course on uh, research in political economy. Look forward to uh, engaging with the uh, students both on Wednesday and even uh, after that. Uh, feel free to uh, email me uh, if you have uh, any questions or want uh, references on uh, readings and writings on uh, Sri Lanka would be uh, happy to uh, share those. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's an interesting lecture. Okay, thank you. Goodbye then. Goodbye, Professor. Okay, thank you, Uncle.